Harmonic motion is the main interpretation of a second order constant coefficient linear differential equation. Since it is so, in this video I want to investigate a particular phenomenon in harmonic motion, resonance. What is resonance? Resonance concerns a harmonic system with forcing, where the forcing is itself periodic. Think again about someone on a swing. If you are pushing someone on a swing and the goal is to swing higher and higher, then you ought to push at the right frequency. Finding the right timing for this is finding the resonance in the system. The resonant frequency is the precise frequency of a forcing term that leads to the greatest amplitude of oscillations in the system. Sometimes resonance is a good thing. An audio engineer might design a room acoustically to have resonance for certain frequencies. However, resonance can also be a problem. A different engineer may want to avoid vibration in whatever they are building for safety or utility reasons. They will want to make sure they avoid any possibility of resonance. With that idea of resonance established, now I want to use the tools of differential equations to see if I can get a mathematical description of resonance. And that's what starts with a new definition regarding friction. Here again is the DE for harmonic motion with friction and forcing. The forcing in this term will be sinusoidal, since that's the situation that allows for resonance. M is mass, B is friction, K is the spring constant, and F of T is the forcing. The homogeneous solutions are given by E to the RT, where R is the solution to the characteristic equation. That quadratic could have real or complex roots. Before I looked at the discriminant of the quadratic, but now I want to define a new constant, zeta equals B over 2 square root of Km, to capture the behavior. Zeta is called the damping constant. Working with a quadratic, you can check that if zeta is less than 1, the situation is underdamped, meaning that the homogeneous equation has sinusoidal solutions with decaying amplitude. If zeta is 1, the situation is critically damped, leading to exponential decay but with repeated roots. And if zeta is larger than 1, the situation is overdamped with exponential decay. Zeta nicely captures the different behaviors of the system. And zeta is only the first of several new constants I'm going to define in this video. For the moment, consider the situation with no friction, that is, zeta equals zero. As before, the homogeneous solutions with no friction are sine and cosine waves with frequency coefficient root k over m. If, this was no f if there were no friction, this is how the system would naturally oscillate. Therefore, this frequency coefficient is called the natural frequency of the system. I'll use the Greek letter omega to label this natural frequency. Then finally, I'll define lambda to be b over 2m. In the underdamped solutions, negative lambda is the coefficient in the exponential decay, so I'll call this the decay coefficient. With these new symbols, the root of the characteristic equation now has this form. Likewise, I can actually rewrite the whole differential equation with these new symbols. Remember, lambda is the decay coefficient, so it makes sense that it replaced friction, which is the source of the decay. And omega is the natural frequency, which is the balance between the mass and the spring constant. I'll use this form for the rest of the video, and I'll work through four cases, with and without friction, and with and without forcing. The ultimate conclusion about resonance is, that, is in the last case, but working through the intermediate cases helps me understand what's going on in the last case. First, if there is no friction and no forcing, then these are the solutions. The system oscillates forever, with no friction or forcing to interfere. The frequency is omega, the natural frequency. What the spring and the mass will naturally do with anything to stop them or push them around in a different way. If there is friction but still no forcing, then this is the DE. Still no friction term, but a forcing term. I can solve for the particular solution. I already have the homogeneous solutions from the previous slide using undetermined coefficients. I'll skip the details, but this is the form of the particular solution, and these are the coefficients that result from the system. I'll assume for now that the natural frequency and the forcing frequency are different, so this is not division by zero. Then I have the particular solution, so I have the general solution by adding the particular solution to the homogeneous solutions. Now let me do this with initial conditions. I'll start the system at rest, no displacement and no initial velocity. Solving for a and b means evaluating y is 0 and y prime is 0, making them both equal to 0, and determining the constants. 
The first equation gives b equals zero, and the second initial condition gives this strange expression for a. If I simplify it down a bunch, this is the particular solution. It looks a bit messy, but I hope to understand it notwithstanding. Remember that omega is the natural frequency and gamma is the forcing frequency. This is a combination of sine waves. I get a complicated waveform and the amplitude depends on the two frequency as well as on f, the strength of the force, of course. This was the situation when the natural frequency and the forcing frequency were different. If they are the same, the steps in the previous solution don't work because of division by zero. I could resolve the system with different techniques, but I can also take the limit of this as the forcing frequency approaches the natural frequency. I can do this as a L'Hopital's limit, with gamma being the variable. After L'Hopital's, there is no more division by zero, so I can just evaluate. And the result is this expression. What has happened in this limit? Well, it's similar, but now there is a t in the amplitude of the second term. This is a major change. The previous solution had waves with fixed amplitude. In the limit, as the forcing frequency and the natural frequency coincide, the result is a wave with linearly increasing amplitude. This is resonance, at least in the ideal non-friction situation. If the forcing is right in tune with the natural frequency, that it all lines up and the amplitude starts to increase. The right frequency to choose in the frictionless situation is exactly the same as the natural frequency. The situation with friction is more complicated since the natural frequency doesn't take into account friction. This is more the more important and the more interesting situation since all models in the actual world do have friction. I need the homogeneous case first, so I'll start without forcing. Here is the differential equation and this is solved by decaying oscillations. Remember, all through this video, I am assuming an underdamped situation. Lambda is the decay coefficient, and the frequency is the square root of the natural frequency squared minus the damping coefficient squared. I'll call this omega d, the damped frequency. This is what the system does without forcing, but with friction. I can do some manipulation with all the various Greek letters I've defined in this video. The result is this expression which is a nice way to understand the damped frequency. Omega is the natural frequency without friction. Gamma is the damping coefficient, measuring friction. In this video, zeta, sorry, zeta is the damping coefficient. In this video, zeta is less than one because this system is under damped. The square root of one minus zeta squared is a nice way to account for the friction. The closer the friction is to one, the closer it is to under damped. The slower, this, this slowdown of the frequency is the solution. Frequency makes it all slower, as you would expect. That gives the homogeneous solution, exponential decay of oscillations with omega d, the damped frequency, as their frequency coefficient. Now finally, I can do the full system with friction and forcing. I used undetermined coefficients, and here is the guess for the particular solution. Note that this particular solution has the forcing frequency. That's how undetermined coefficients work. The guess has the same frequency coefficient as the forcing. Solving the system for these coefficients is actually pretty messy since it's all a pile of unknown Greek letters since I'm doing this in general. So I haven't shown all of that work, but this is the result. So with these coefficients, this is the particular solution. Notice the denominators are the same, so I put it all over one denominator. Then the general solution is the particular solution plus the homogeneous solutions. What's going on here? The solutions are all oscillations. The homogeneous ones decay, so they don't contribute in the long run. And then I have two amplitude coefficients, omega squared minus gamma squared and two gamma lambda. Remember in the first part of this part of the course, I talked about how amplitudes combine when sine and cosine have the same frequency but different amplitude. Here is where I will need that result. The total amplitude here is the Pythagorean combination of the two amplitudes, the square root of the sum of the two squares. Capital F and the denominator factor out, so this expression is the amplitude. Notice that the numerator is just the square root of the denominator, so this simplifies to just a square root in the denominator. All right, we've done a huge pile of work to get here. 
This is the amplitude of the solution when there is both friction and forcing. Now, what is resonance? Resonance is choosing a forcing frequency, gamma, such that the amplitude is as large as possible. So I need to maximize the amplitude. Taking a limit here doesn't help. There isn't an undefined pro point to approach, and just choosing the natural or damped frequency doesn't actually do the trick. So instead, I'll try and optimize using derivatives. The maximum amplitude can only happen when the derivative is zero. So I take the derivative of amplitude in the variable gamma, the forcing frequency, since that's what I'm changing, and set it equal to zero. And then I solve for the critical point, which much must be a maximum here. The result of this is the forcing frequency gamma equal to the square root of omega squared minus two lambda squared. All right, let me interpret this. The damped frequency is less than the natural frequency according to the difference in the square root. Friction controls this. The second form shows one minus gamma squared and gamma is the damping coefficient, the piece that measures friction. Then I calculate the maximum possible amplitude of a forcing term. That maximum amplitude happens when the forcing frequency is this expression. This is almost the same as the damping frequency. The only difference instead of one minus zeta squared, it's one minus two zeta squared. There are two things to notice about this. First, this is slower than the damped frequency. Unlike the frictionless case, where matching the natural frequency produced the growing amplitude, friction really does change the system. The resonant frequency is quite a bit slower than even the damped frequency, which is itself slower than the natural frequency. Second, there is a condition here. The previous square root always made sense for any underdamped system. Here, however, the two makes the square root more problematic. Now I need zeta squared to be less than one half, which means that zeta is less than one over root two. But remember, zeta is the damping coefficient. Smaller zeta is less friction. So the friction needs to be quite limited to allow resonance to happen at all. Not all systems, even under damped ones, even have a resonant frequency. And this again is important for the applications. If you are designing a system that doesn't want resonant frequency, i.e. a system where amplitude can't be maximized, you may have to add in enough friction to cross this one over root two threshold. If you do want resonance in acoustics or some other similar situation, then you have to limit friction to allow for it.